We had a very, very large scale drought. I haven't in my long life experienced monsoon failure so severe. Two thirds of India has had less than 60% rain. When I was in the area of Jharkhand, the farmers who had totally become dependent on the seeds of the Green Revolution, the chemically red seeds, still had their nurseries in the month of July. They could not transplant. And we transplant in June or early July, that's when the monsoon comes. They couldn't transplant because there was no water. And chemical agriculture ha has gone hand in hand with water intensive cultivation. So even though these varieties had been called high yielding varieties, in fact, the paddy fields were totally empty. The farmers had been working with us and had got over the inferiority complex of the indigenous grains, like the millet, the manua. Their fields had a crop. And for me, it was one more confirmation of the fact that we have neglected the kind of breeding for diversity that we need desperately in times of climate change. When you don't know whether the rain will come in time or not, you don't know what your temperatures are going to be, you have no idea whether you're going to have a flood or a drought. It's best to have diversity. We can now only go forward by picking up the threads of our broken histories and nature's broken evolution. It's only through that that we can build the bridge to the future. Because a century of breeding for industrial agriculture has been a breeding for uniformity, and uniformity is a guarantee for very high risk and very high vulnerability. Climate chaos is what we are facing because the patterns of the climate have been disrupted. They've been disrupted because the ecological base of the planet has been disrupted. And industrial farming has a lot to do with it. 70% of the land is under agriculture. Large part of it is now industrially farmed. Increasing parts of it is using industrial seed. 70% of the water is now used in agriculture. And at least in countries like India, 70% of the people still make a living through agriculture. So whether it is the climate problem or the food problem, unless we address it in a way that we can build back the resilience of our farming systems. We're going to have more and more empty fields of the kind that I saw in Charkhan, also in my own state, Uttarakhand, where for, for two seasons we haven't had a crop because of rainfall failure. Again, something totally unprecedented. I first understood the limitations of industrial breeding in 1984. 1984 was the year the state of India, Punjab, where the Green Revolution was introduced and for which Norman Borlaug was given the Nobel Prize for Peace on the ground that Punjab would now be so prosperous. The United Nations, even very early in the days, had said these should not be called high yielding varieties. They should be called high response varieties because they have been bred for responding to chemicals. In and of themselves, they do not give high yields. They require intensive water inputs, and my studies have shown 10 times more water is used to produce the same amount of food. And water is what we are running out of. In fact, in the states which have had the Green Revolution in India, there's now such a severe groundwater crisis. NASA has just issued a new report saying in five years' time, um, northern India has lost 
100 cubic kilometers of groundwater. And that's just in five years' time. But the states that are losing groundwater the fastest are the states that are cultivating crops through chemicals, and these were the crops bred for high response. We were always told that the Green Revolution was meant to address hunger, but if you really get down to it, what did the Green Revolution do? All it did was create dwarf varieties, and it changed the biomass partitioning of crops. So there was more biomass of the grain and next to no biomass left for the soil to go as organic matter, to go to the cattle, to go as fodder. And you traded off the yield increase in grain with a depletion of other functions of the crop. So you reduced the plant to a one-dimensional plant, but you reduced farming systems to monocultures too. Because once you were designing farming to respond to external chemical inputs, after all, every crop has a different requirement, and so you could not grow 10 crops in a field or 9 crops in a field chemically. You now had to have that one crop that had been designed for that much chemical and that much water. High response breeding for chemicals necessitated the creation of monocultures. And in the state of Punjab, more than 250 crops used to be grown, species used to be grown, it was reduced to rice in one season and wheat in one season. The assumption, of course, that this would uh, generate prosperity did not last because the initial subsidies from the World Bank evaporated very fast and after a while the farmers had to bear the costs of constantly increasing chemical input. It has increased 300 times since the introduction of the Green Revolution. Multiplied by 100 for the percentage increase. So we are talking of a burden that farmers are left with, but the soils are left with. And now we can see the soils that have been chemically fertilized in response to the plants bred for chemicals are now the very um, areas, the very areas that are most vulnerable to climate change because they have absolutely no water holding capacity. Organic matter is what gives soils the capacity to hold moisture and therefore the capacity to deal with climate change where increasing water stress is one predictable outcome. And so we contribute to climate change because the data is now out and the International Commission on the Future of Food, which will have a session on the seed issue uh, at this conference. Our latest uh, our, our report on climate change and, uh, and food security shows that if you, if you add the production through chemical agriculture, you add the long distance transport, and you then add the conversion of primeval forests to commodity production, like the Amazon and the rainforests of uh, Indonesia. You add it all, it's about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions.